I want to start off by saying that uh, I stood up here for morning worship and, uh, and we started singing a look back and I see Kayla back there running the camera uh, and I just was touched by that. Of course, as you know, the Gerhardt suffered a great loss this past week and look back and there's young Caleb doing what he's called to do in spite of a great loss. So <clears throat> appreciate that, Caleb. And our hearts and minds, our thoughts go out to the whole Gerhardt family after the great loss. But I just wanted to recognize what you see as service taking place right here. <clears throat> uh, I'm speaking for Brent today. Uh, Brent is away on a retreat this weekend and had asked me to, to preach for him. Uh, used to preach a lot back in the day, not so much anymore. Uh, my congregation is usually in handcuffs. It's good to see you so moving about freely. Uh, and so that's encouragement. But it's, a, again, a good, good to be here preaching today. Um, our lesson today is called The Unforgiving Servant. And that's the title of, well, it's really the title of the message. Brent gave it to me. It's a title of the passage. A lot of times if you look this passage up in the Bible, you'll see something like The Unforgiving Servant. The unforgiving steward, the, the unmerciful servant, something like that. And when I saw the title, I knew the passage, and I got kind of excited because this is a real heavy hitter. This is, this is a big one. I mean, it, it kind of gets us right where we are. And so I was very excited to be able to, to, to bring this message to you today. So let's first take a look at the passage. It's in uh, Matthew chapter 18, and I'll read it here. Then Peter came to him, that's Jesus. And said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Up to seven times? You said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. Therefore, the king of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with the servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold his, with his wife and children and all that he had, and the payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were grieved, very grieved, and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers. And so he should pay all that was due to him. And read with me this final verse. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Let's bow our hearts just for a word of prayer once more. Father God, we're humbled by your word. It reaches us, Lord. It reaches us and touches us in new and exciting ways every time that we read it. And Lord, I pray that this morning as we Study your word together once more, that it will, new, it will reach out and touch us in new ways. It will change us, Lord. We pray that you would open our hearts and minds to see the things that the Spirit would teach us today. As we pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Some of you are probably uh, old enough to remember uh, Corey Ten Boom, or at least the story of Corey Ten Boom. Um, this is a, a woman, of course she passed away in 1983. Uh, some of the younger folk may not remember that name. Uh, I, I grew up in, in, as a teenager in the 70s, and The Hiding Place was very, it was out of the time, the book and the movie, it was very popular. And I remember hearing story after story of Corey Ten Boom. They were a family who grew up in the Netherlands, in Holland, and during the onset of World War II, they were a Christian family. And they were watching what Hitler was doing to the Jews, and they just couldn't take it. Their, their Christian faith called them to do something. You know, sometimes our Christian faith, or I should say all the time, our Christian faith causes us to take a stand. And the, the Ten Boom family did exactly that. They took a stand. What they began to do, if you're not familiar with the story, is as a young girl, she and her family began to hide the Jews. 
And they had secret compartments all throughout their house. They hid them, and they would help smuggle them out of the country. They did this with, under great threat because they knew if they got caught that they would be severely punished. And eventually, that's exactly what happened. They were caught, and they were imprisoned. Corey and her sister Betsy were put in a concentration camp together. Now, uh, they lasted until, well, Corey was released eventually. Incidentally, her story of release is remarkable. She believed it was a clerical error that allowed her to be released from the concentration camp because 12 days later, all the women who she was uh, with were sent to the gas chamber. And yet she miraculously survived the war. But her sister Betsy did not. She died of malnutrition, of disease, of just all of the, the horrors that happened in a, in a concentration camp. Now, after the war, Corey would write a book called The Hiding Place, and she would go on tours, and she would speak to groups, and she would talk about the love of God and, and, and how faith carried her through those difficult times. Now, there was an occasion when, just a few years after the war, she was speaking in a church, and after the service was over, a man came to her. And she didn't recognize him at first, but as he began to speak, she did. Turns out this man was a prison guard at the very concentration camp that she was imprisoned at. Just so happens that this man was one of the most cruelest of guards at this particular camp, and he was at least somewhat responsible for her sister's death. The man came up to her after the study was over, after the talk was over, and he said to her, I am now a Christian. I believe that God has forgiven all of my sins. And he said, and I would like to ask you, will you forgive me? Corey, as she describes, she thought to herself, no, I can't forgive you. My sister died at your hands. How could I ever, how could I ever forgive you? And she said, her first thought was, I can't do that. Can't forgive him. We'll talk more later about Corey. But you know, regardless of whether you've had a situation as bad as Corey, the Corey did is not the case. I believe that all of us in here, every one of us, at one point or another, was harmed by someone else. We were misused, we were abused, we were neglected, we were hurt. Somebody tramped on us. Someone did something, and you didn't go looking for it. You didn't ask for this. Someone did something that they should not have done. This is the common human experience. And there isn't a person in here who hasn't felt that to some degree. You've been there. I know that you have. And if you haven't, buckle up. You will be. It will happen. There will be a time in your life when someone does something that they should not have done, and you will be faced with the same situation. Can I forgive that person? You might even ask yourself, how can I forgive that person? I told you earlier, this is a real hard hitter, and it is. This, this is an important lesson, and I want to take our time going through the passage. Now, the passage we read starts out with, with Peter... Peter comes to Jesus. Now, I don't know what's going on in Peter's world at this particular moment. Something maybe have happened to him. I, I don't know. I don't know what he's thinking. But he comes to Jesus, and he asks him, Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother? If he, if he does something to me, how often shall I forgive my brother? How many times? And then I think, in a, probably a moment of generosity, Peter said, seven times? Probably expecting Jesus to say, oh, come on, Peter, that's ridiculous. Not seven times. I mean, my goodness, you're, you're far more generous than I would be. Now, seven times, Peter, uh, Jesus, is that, is that how many times you want me to forgive someone who's, who's harmed me? And again, I'm thinking, Peter's probably thinking, I, I probably picked a good number there. I mean, of course, seven. You know, seven's a, a great number in the Bible, and seven's this number of perfection, and this is probably right. He said, you know, if my brother sins against me, I don't think he's thinking of Andrew necessarily here, just someone in his circle. Someone like in your circle, perhaps. How many times would I forgive and should I forgive that person? Now, you know what Jesus answered to him? He said, I say to you, not seven times, but seven times, 70 times seven. Do we have any math wizards in here? Judy, I know you're good at math. 490. 490, yes. The prize goes to Judy. 
You get your calculator out, you can check her out on that. She's exactly right. <laughs> she wiped the sweat off her brow. Um, 490 times. 70 times 7. Now, I don't believe for a moment that Jesus is using this in a literal way. I mean, even if he is, that's pretty phenomenal if you ask me. To forgive somebody 490. Incidentally, though, if 7 is a number of perfection, 70, 7 times 10 is 70. This is... Ten times over perfection, it would seem like. And it seems to me that these numbers are used maybe to kind of get Peter's attention, to grab him, for, for example. It's like, it's 490 times? What are, what are you talking about, Jesus? I'm going to forgive my brother that many times? That's how often you want me to forgive someone who's harmed me? That's the number you're thinking, Jesus? This is crazy. Again, I think that Jesus is not using this number literally, but sort of just as a way of, well... Get his attention because it's almost an absurd number. Wow. Wow. And, I, and I'm sure you agree with me that Jesus is saying, there's no end to it, Peter. I don't, I don't expect an end to this at all. But this gives Jesus a, a good opportunity to teach a lesson. And that's what he did often. You know, something happened, and then he turned to his disciples and he just teaches something based on what happened. He was a great teacher like that. And so he launched into the parable of of the unmerciful servant or the, uh, the unforgiving steward, however you want to say it, and he tells them the story. Peter, while your jaw is still hanging on the floor, let me just tell you a story that illustrates what I'm trying to say to you. He said there once was this, this king, and this, this king was settling accounts one day. This king apparently had people who, who were in debt to him, and it's time for them to to, to settle the accounts, and he brings them all in. And there's one particular servant of his who comes before the king who owns, owes him 10,000 talents. Now, I found in the New American Standard a footnote along with that. 10,000 talents, it was footnoted saying, by one estimate, estimate, this is a debt of 60 million working days. A lot of money. So we'll take in 60 million days to pay that debt. Quite obvious that this is Another absurd number, meant to grab your attention, meant to shock you. 10,000 talents. The, the man owes him that much? It's obvious. How, how do you pay that? He would need 60 million people to work one day to pay that. How is one man supposed to pay that? And, and the man couldn't. In fact, when the man finds about his dad, he, he, he falls to his knees and he says, Just give, give me a little more time. Actually, remember that line. Give me a little more time. Just, just give me a little bit more and I'll pay you everything that I owe you. Just, 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 just asking for that. Because what the king was going to do was command that he, his, actually his wife and his kids you'll see there, sitting off in the background of this painting, I'm going to take them all and sell them to prison, a debtor's prison, to pay off the debt. Now that even won't pay the debt off, but at least I can take a hunk of it. And you know, the king, the, 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 the master here, had every right to do that. The man legitimately owed him a debt. He owed him money, and he was not paying the money, and the man should do whatever should be done legally to get the debt paid for. So if the story ended right here, if the story ended right here, no harm, no foul. The king said, you owe me? You owe me? Yes. Can you pay it? No. Well, I'm going to have to sell you off. If the story ended there, it, okay, it's a story of unfortunate, but it's, it's just... No, no one could argue that it was unjust. But now, now, now the corners of the capstone of this entire passage, the, the centerpiece where it all hinges, the fulcrum of this whole message happens in the next passage. We'll read, then the master of that servant was moved with compassion. This is a great master. He was moved with compassion. He released him and forgave him the debt. Wow. Moved. Now, compassion, incidentally, compassion comes from two words. The first, or the second here, passion, we'll talk about that first. Passion really literally means to suffer. Remember the movie, The Passion of the Christ? It means the suffering of Jesus. It's the sufferings of Christ. So the word passion means to suffer. And the prefix calm just means to with, with, to suffer with. And that's what compassion means, is to suffer with. And so the master, uh, the, the, the king in this story, saw the servant fall to his knees, realized this man could never pay the dead back, and he suffered with him. Well, you've got you to gotta like this guy. I mean, you've got to like this guy. Not only is he just, because we saw his justice coming through, but he's also merciful. Because what he did is, you know what? 
He said to the servant, why don't you just get up off your knees? Forget it. Forget it. Here's that IOU, and he tears it up, the contract. That debt that you owe me, I'm no longer holding it against you. You don't owe it anymore. Could you imagine what that must have sounded like? This man owed an astronomical amount of money, a fee that he could never even hope to think about repaying, and suddenly in a moment, it's wiped clean, it's gone. It's gone. I mean, this kind of money had to hang over his head like a black cloud every single day. It had to dictate every decision he made. You know, can we buy this groceries or that? Should I save up for this? Because i got this debt to pay. I can't afford this because I've got to do this with the money. Everything this man has to do has to probably be just centered around this great debt that he owes. It's phenomenal. And now suddenly the king said, forget it. You don't owe me anymore. It's over. You imagine the bank calls you and says, hey, that mortgage, forget it. That car loan, you know what? Just keep the car. How about those student loans you're paying off? You know what? We don't care. We hope your kid does really well in school. We're just going to forgive it all. I mean, that would be phenomenal, wouldn't it? I mean, you'd be thinking, wow, yeah, to have my mortgage paid for just with a phone call, someone just forgives the debt? That would be fantastic. And so I think, I think in a moment we can kind of we can kind of realize what this, this man is going through, the servant. Yeah. Holy smokes, I'm, I'm free. My goodness, as he, as he leaves that king's hallway, I bet his feet don't touch the floor. You know, I mean, he's just, he's floating. This is... This, this, this great weight of debt had been lifted from his shoulders. He doesn't owe anybody anything anymore. He's, he's free. He's free. And he, he leaves the king's hall free, a free man. And now if the story had been there, we would have a really great story. We'd have something to talk about. We'd have lots of, of good fodder here for sermons because the story there is really good. But it doesn't end there, does it? It takes a bit of a turn because as the, as the man leaves the king's presence, he encounters someone else who owed him a few hundred denarii. Now, I don't know what the exact equivalent of that is. Let's just call it a couple hundred bucks. I mean, nothing comparable to 10,000 pounds. So he meets a fellow servant. This is an equal. This is someone, his, his own standing. This is a, you know, a colleague of his. And he meets somebody who owes him you know, a few hundred bucks. And what does he do? Does he say, hey, you're not going to guess what happened to me. No, he takes him by the throat and you can come to see him up against the wall. Pay me what you owe me. Come on, where's my money? I have been waiting for that hundred bucks. I have been waiting and you will not pay me back. Where is my money? Now the man who was just talking to the second servant, he drops to his knees and he said, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Did we hear that somewhere else? Yes, we did. Because this is exactly, word for word, what the first servant had said to the master, to the king. Just have patience with me. And so the second servant, gagging with a, a, a hand about his throat, said, you pay me, give me one more time, I will pay you everything. And now you would hope that you know, at the fact that he repeated his own words, that at this point in the story, he's going to say, ah, oh, oh, you know what? I mean, I, I screwed up. You know what? I know exactly what it's like. I've, I've been there myself. I, I've been there. I know what it's like. Oh, something you can't pay. Forget it. But he doesn't. In fact, what he does, he does something that's just, I guess, and that he says he commands him to be thrown into prison until he pays his debt. Get out of here. Make, take this man under arrest. He owes me these hundred, a couple hundred dollars. I want him locked up until this is paid off. And he felt very justified by doing it. You know, Jesus was a masterful storyteller. And this one here in particular is one of the best. And I say that because there isn't a one of you who doesn't feel some sort of emotion when you hear that. When you see him mentally grabbing that second servant, throwing him against the wall by the throat, and saying, pay me what you owe, it's hard to sit there 
and, and look at him and not say, you jerk. You idiot. Oh, come on. If that would be me, here's what I would do. This story just, it's wonderful because it brings you into it. It's so easy to see ourselves in the story and to feel the emotions of it. This is just a wonderful, wonderful story. Except for the trouble is it sometimes highlights parts of us that are hard to deal with. Now, after this, there are the fellow servants. These are some servants who they saw what happened to the master and, and they see what's going on and they go back to tell the king. Now, this is not tattletelling. I'll say that for the benefit of Karen. Yeah, this is not tattletelling. This is not going to the teacher and saying, you know what he just did? Now, these people were really upset. I mean, they were really upset. They watched what happened and, oh. In fact, these fellow servants felt exactly what you just did when you heard and you saw this story play out. You think, oh, that idiot. Oh, what would he do that for? And so they go back to the king, maybe even grieved by all of this. And they said, you're, you're not going to believe what just happened out there. You know that guy, you just forgave him that 10,000 times? And they told him the truth. Here's what he just did. And so the master, the king, he calls the man back into his presence. And he can say, you idiot, what, what, were, what were you thinking? He says, so should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way, just as I had mercy on you? Now, that's kind of rhetorical, meaning it's not an answer, because there really isn't an answer to give, is there? Yeah, I guess. I should have, but I, I didn't. And his master now, his compassion that he had, that feeling uh, 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 that, that, that hurt that he shared with him turns to anger, uh, righteous anger here, because uh, you felt it too. We feel very angry here. And he said he handed him over to the torturers, and I'll, I'll talk about that in, in a little bit later here, to repay all that was owed. So the debt was restored to the man. Because, why? Because he wasn't merciful like him. Now, it's not hard. It doesn't take an Einstein, it doesn't take a wizard to figure out what all of this means. Remember, Peter came to Jesus and started this whole question out. How many times do I forgive my brother if he sinned against me? I'll just have a time. That's what started this whole conversation. That's what started this whole monologue of Jesus. Is, is this whole story was about Peter's question. And so we can see this is not about financial freedom at all. This has nothing to do with finances. This has to do with another kind of debt, a debt of our sin. Do you know that when you and I sin, when we tell a lie, when we misrepresent ourselves, when we cheat on our taxes, when we do anything, any myriad of things that go against God, we sin against God. It's His law, ultimately, that we're breaking. And when we do that, it's as if we are creating a great debt to God. All of the things that we have done. And you know, you can't undo those. Once they're done and you can't squeeze the toothpaste back into the tube any longer, they're out there, they're done, you, you can't recall them, and then there's no way to really effectively deal with it unless you're forgiven. And you can see that this is what the story means here. This is what it's all about. This is about the great debt that you and I have incurred with God. The things that you and I have done wrong, failed to do right, We've accumulated a debt. And we go to God. And we say, God, I've sinned against you. Those things I've done, I'm sorry. I wish that I had not done them. I'd like to unsay those things. I'd like to undo those things, but I can't. And God moved with compassion. He's hurting. He's suffering with you. He knows what it's like to be us because he became one. And he says to you, that debt's gone. Forget it. You, you don't owe me anymore. That great debt that you've incurred, you don't owe me. And, and, and some of you may remember that first feeling of being forgiven 
you know, the, literally as if the debt has been lifted off your shoulders, the, the weight of the sin, and we walk out with our feet barely touching the floor. Because I'm forgiven. I'm light as a feather now because God forgave me what I did against him. But the problem is, is our story sometimes turns sour as well, doesn't it? Because we leave the king's prisons, and then sometimes we encounter those who've harmed us. They have a debt against us. They've done something to us. They've grieved us. They've harmed us. They've abused us. They've neglected us. They've that betrayed us somehow, and we encounter them, and immediately we forget what just happened over there. And we demand justice. You pay me what you owe. You never should have done that to me. How dare you treat me like that? What were you thinking to do that to me? We've forgotten what God has done for all of us. And so this story is not just a, an emotional story. It's a story about us, what makes it emotional. This, this, is, this is me neglecting to remember what God has done for my, in my life and for me when I encounter someone else. Now, guaranteed, this is hard. This is really, really hard really hard to release the debt against us. It really is. And this is one of those where the rubber meets the road kind of Bible passages. Because this is about really living your faith. Not just talking about it. Not just coming to Sunday school. Not just singing you know, in the choir. This is about really living your faith. Putting into motion the very things that God wants you to live out. And this is a hard one. I'm telling you, this is hard. If, if you've never thought about it, then you need to. And if you do think about it, you'll understand very quickly just how hard it is. Think for a moment of maybe that person in your life who has done something that they ought not to have done. They've said something to you that they ought not to have said. They've harmed you in some way. They've created a debt against you. Just think of a name if you're able to. How hard is it to forgive them? It can be very, very hard. Depending on how great the debt is, the greater the debt, the harder it becomes to release them of that debt. And yet, Jesus is explaining to Peter, this is how I want you to operate. God forgives you, you forgive others. And, and I know what, what we're thinking here because we're thinking, I can't. Corrie Ten Boom, when she, when she met that, that prison guard, her first thought was, I can't forgive him. How can I ever forgive this man? And I know as we sometimes think of these people who harm us, we think the same things. How can I ever forgive this person for what they've done? Now, I, I tell you, I think the reason why we can't oftentimes is because we misunderstand forgiveness. We don't really know what it is. And there's a couple myths about forgiveness that I think if we understand what they are and can recognize them, we'll be better apt to forgive the people in our lives. Oh, this is what Jesus said. So my heavenly Father also will do to you, each of you, from his heart, he does not forgive his brother's trespasses. This is about us. This is, this is about us. We, we, every, every Sunday, we, we close with the Lord's Prayer. And forgive us of our debts as we, in the same way as we forgive our debts. God, I want you to treat me like I treat other people. <coughs> That's what we're saying every Sunday when we say that. God, I want you to forgive me the same way that I do with other people. That's a darn scary prayer. Because if we're not living it, we're almost saying, God, don't forgive me. I don't want you to forgive me. So I'm going to figure it out. I want to talk about what forgiveness is not. A couple, just three points on this. Because this, I think this could help you if you're sitting there, if you're sitting there mad at me right now, thinking, don't, don't go there, Jane. Don't even, don't even go there. I, I think if you can understand what forgiveness is not, then maybe you can get to where you need to be. First thing, it is not saying that what happened is okay. 
It is not saying that what happened to you is all right. If you forgive someone, you're not saying, oh, that was great. I love what you did there. No. It was wrong. It was wrong. It is wrong. It will always be wrong. It will never be okay. And if you forgive them, you are not saying that what you did is okay. Because when God forgives you, he's not saying that what you did was fine with him. He's just forgiving you of it. He's releasing you of the debt. So if you release the debt of someone else, if someone else has harmed you and you are forgiving them, you are not saying that what you, what you did is all right. You are not. It's not admission of that. So, so don't be afraid. And sometimes we can think this. We really, really do. If I forgive him, it's like I'm saying it's okay. No. It's not okay. It never will be okay. It's not a sign of weakness. And this is a big one too. Because sometimes we think, if I forgive that person for what they've done, they're just going to think I'm weak. And well, they may, but I guess it depends on who you're trying to please, that person or God. But it's not a sign of weakness. As a matter of fact, it is not weakness. I guarantee you, this will be the hardest thing you will ever do. This will take every bit of you and more. Because that's where God steps in. This becomes so difficult that it becomes a divine thing. This is the power of the living God flowing through you to get it done. That's how hard it is. It is not weakness. Don't ever go that way. Don't ever think that. Because it's not. This is not weakness. Those who can forgive are the strongest people I've ever met. And it's not an invitation to be hurt again. You're not saying, oh, I forgive you for what you did now. Come on back and just do it all again. No. No. There are some people out there that are dangerous. They're sick. They're twisted. They're unhealthy. They will hurt you. It's not good to keep inviting that back into your lives. Forgiving them from what they've done. And you know, maybe you just need to separate yourself from the person who's hurt you. You're not, you're not an open invitation to come back. The person who's hurt you, you may forgive them and never talk to them again. That's not unforgiveness. You're just saying, it's no longer, it's, you no longer owe me. And I'm walking clear of that debt. You do the same. It's not an invitation. You don't have to send them a birthday card. You don't have to friend them on Facebook. I mean, you don't have to do any of that. You can go your own way. You're not asking for it to happen again. On an invitation. Now, that, those three things what forgiveness is not. I, I want to talk about what it is, because this is also very important. First of all, forgiveness is a celebration of what God has done for me. This is a celebration. It doesn't feel like it, does it? When you forgive someone that great debt, when you've released someone from hurting from you, it doesn't feel like a celebration, but we don't go by feelings, do we, as Christians? We go by faith. This is a celebration. Think again of that servant who went to his master, was forgiven this phenomenal debt, this unthinkable amount of money, and he walks out just walking on air. He should have celebrated what just happened by releasing the debt of the other person. You and I need to do the same thing. We need to start celebrating the forgiveness that we receive from God. The celebration of what God has released us from. And the best way to do it, I can guarantee you, the best way to do it is not just sing a worship song, that's fine, but go forgive somebody. Go find someone who's debted against you and forgive them of that debt. That is how you celebrate God's forgiveness in your life. It's not easy, but it's wonderful. Beautiful celebration. I believe that God, looking down on our lives, sees a beautiful thing playing out when we forgive somebody. It may not feel beauty in that moment, you know? It may feel like the farthest thing from beauty. It may feel like the farthest thing from something that's peaceful or, or, or wonderful. But I guarantee you, from God's vantage point, that's exactly what he's seen. He's seen something very beautiful in your life as you forgive somebody. Celebration. Second of all, I'm sorry that's so small. I didn't, I didn't look at this and didn't realize it's so small and it's great. It's releasing the burden so I can be free. That's what it is. It's releasing the burden so I can be free. You know, when, when we hold on to unforgiveness, when we hold on to resentment, when we refuse to forgive someone, somehow we think that's empowered us. That's made us stronger. That's made us better, faster, six million dollar man stuff. You know, it's made us just a better person. It's not. It hasn't. 
What really, what really does it, what really creates the, the freedom is releasing the burden, is forgiving. You know, it, it's often said, I think I have it up here, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. You heard that? Uh, unforgiving, forgiving, not forgiving somebody. It's like taking a glass of poison and then I'm going to drink this down and I hope that person gets sick and die. It doesn't work like that. Who gets sick and who dies? Us. And that's what unforgiveness does. It tears us up. I guarantee you, the person, the name that you have, the person you were thinking of earlier, who's probably indebted themselves to you by harming you right now, is probably walking down the street, whistling Dixie, having a good time, not even thinking about the pain that you're carrying. They, they're mindless of it. They don't know it exists. But you do. And the only way to be free from that is not beating them up forgiving them. That's the way to find freedom. It's not easy. It's not easy. And finally, it's a command. It's God's command. This is not, well, hey, if you can't do it, but if you don't, and I'm totally get this. No, 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 no. No, this is God's command. This is what he wants us to do. This is what he commands you to do. This is what he wants you to do to forgive them. And I know it seems hard, and I'm going to give you a starting point in a moment. But I, I'm going to roll a video here of Corey Ten Boom telling the story that I started to share with you from her point of view. Just a little short video. Brandon, if you could just bring that up. Somewhere. It was some time ago that I was in Berlin and there came a man to me and said, Ah, Mr. Bohm, I am glad to see you. Don't you know me? And suddenly I saw that man that was one of the most cruel aufseers in concentration camp. And that man said, I have, I'm now a Christian, I have found the Lord Jesus, I read my Bible and I know that there is forgiveness for all the sins of the whole world, also for my sins. I have forgiveness for the cruelties I have done, but then I have asked God grace for an opportunity that I could ask one of my very victims forgiveness. And Fräulein Zambom, will you forgive me? And I could not. I remembered the suffering of my dying sister through him. But when I saw, when I experienced that I could not forgive, suddenly I knew I myself have no forgiveness. But I was not able, I could not, I could only hate him. Then I took one of these beautiful texts, one of these boundless resources, Romans 5.5, 5, and thank you, Father, that your love is stronger than my hatred and unforgiveness. That same moment I was free, and I could say, Brother, give me your hand, and I shook hands with him, and it was as if I felt God's love stream through my arms. You never touch so the ocean of God's love as that you forgive your enemies. Can you forgive? No. I can't either. But he can. that sense, well, here's one of the ways to do it, to forget. She was able to extend her hand and shake the hand of the man responsible for the death of her sister in the concentration camp. And it's only the power of God that made her do that. If you want to touch the power of God, you want to come in connection with the power of God in your life, you've got to learn to forget. Now it starts, we're almost done here. It begins begins with a commitment. 
You might be thinking there right this morning, thinking, I, I, I can't forgive that person. You don't know what they've done to me. I can't forgive them. Okay, I get that much. But can you, at this very moment, can you at least make a commitment to do it? It, just, it starts with that. If you can just sit there today just, and just say, Dear God, I want to forgive that person's name there. I want to forgive that person. Please help me. You don't have to in this moment know how it's going to be done. You don't know how it, it, God has to work this out in your life. You don't know, have to know all the answers. All you need to do, just make the commitment. Just make the commitment today. God, you know what this person has done. And I want to love you. I don't know how I'll ever release them of the debt that they've created. I don't know how I'll ever release this. But if you're willing to help me, let's do it. That's all I'm asking today. That, that's it. You don't have to walk out of here totally, completely free. Just walk out of here with a commitment. I will forgive that person. Will you close in prayer with me? Father God. We know that the call to live like you can be difficult at times. Lord, I'd ask that your power and your love and your spirit would be present with those here today who have made that commitment, who have prayed, I will forgive. Let your grace be with them, O oh God. Walk with them through the coming days, weeks, and months, even years, that they might release that burden and walk freely with you. We pray these things in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.